Is this just markets playing catch up though? I think there is a large degree of that. Um, you know, you've had this long period of very compressed volatility, as Manus was saying, and um, the markets haven't really had a new stimulus to deal with. Mm. Now they're sitting there and they're debating, is this a change in policy? Are, are we at the end of the road for monetary policy? Are we now talking about fiscal policy taking over the reins? Because um, obviously that has fairly significant fiscal implications. Mm. I think most likely a lot of this is to do with positioning and we're back after summer sort of thing, rather than necessarily this is a big fundamental shift in the economic outlook. Policymakers, if you listen to them in Jackson Hole, clearly still believe that they have levers to pull should they need to. So to this, this seismic shift towards fiscal policy, I think, is... Uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's something that's going on in the background, but I don't think it's some big catalyst for a huge change at this mm -hmm. point. I just wonder to what extent, what we've got here is the 30-year government bond. I mean, the biggest two-day sell-off uh, in almost a year. Mm -hmm. Now, is that markets which were complacent, or is that just re-evaluating what's going on with the other central banks and the other yield curves around the world? I just wonder, is this more an ECB BOJ story, which we'll talk more about, versus a Fed story? I don't think it is actually that, 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 that move in the US market. Yeah. I think it is more to do with the JGB curve and this, the 30 year part of a yield curve, whether it's globally trading as one, and they have been for yes. quite some time. Um, so, with the Bank of Japan allegedly thinking about some form of, um, you know, they didn't like the extent of the flattening they saw in the JGB curve. So, looking for something more of a normalisation, that's bound to have carryover implications for other long ends, mm. particularly the US, where they are talking about potentially higher rates at the same time. Also, it's been a very crowded trade, so it, it, it is very difficult to disentangle what is going on in terms of is there a big policy shift and is this just the market. Mm getting a shock after a long period of, as you used the word, complacency. You uh, talk about people getting more cautious on holding treasuries. We've got a chart here showing treasury optimism fading. Uh, this is bets uh, on bond futures being at the lowest level since March. Speculative net treasury bond futures positions. This is from uh, CFTC data. Um, we're looking ahead, of course, to the Fed meeting. We're getting all these conflicting signals from different policymakers. Where do you see this market going now? And do you think there's going to be any kind of flip-flopping from Brainard? Um, on the latter point, no, I don't. I see, I see no reason why she should flip-flop. She is towards the dovish end of the yeah. spectrum anyway. And if you look at the recent run of US data, the, the, the ISMs, um, both services and manufacturing, were weak. The last payrolls wasn't exactly a blowout number. Mm. Um, there's no particular reason for her to be shifting stance at this point. I think also, with so many people focused on this comment and this particular meeting, mm. uh, the last thing I want to do is sort of throw a grenade over the, over the trenches and upset the markets at this point in time because that in itself could stop them moving, ironically. Well, it's yeah. interesting that, uh, because what we've got a chart, we've got work, WIRP, which of course, gun luck on, on Friday. We're all going to get the t-shirts made up. You know, we will not be dictated mm -hmm. to by a WIRP. Um, but it, it, it tracks the, the moments of data uh, and the moments uh, of vocabulary used by various Fed members. And there, there you go. Uh, it, it, it's actually a little bit of a chart that we've got prepared for you. But we'll bring it up in a moment. Um, there it is. Would they really? And this is, this, is, this is the thing. You say they're not going to throw a grenade into the bond market. I just wonder then, does this back end next year, what would you expect next year? If they don't, if they don't explode the bond market now in the back quarter? Well, think of it another way. Are we into a, a, a suddenly immensely strong reflationary world? No. Growth is going to remain relatively anemic and unless there is a, a big shock on the political side in the US, we're not going to get a shock on all fiscal stimulus. So growth is going to be okay and inflation is going to be low. Can I just ask you, the incident with Clinton over the weekend, the markets have priced in a Clinton victory, more or less. Do you think that that will shake the markets at all? I, I, I mean, it's going She's to make, taken two days it's, out. It's, it's going to make people nervous, right? Because you, you don't know how pe voters are going to react to that kind of news because people have odd perceptions when it comes to voting. So, who knows? Um, anything to do with that, anything that increases the potential chance of a Trump victory is definitely going to unsettle the markets. 
Um, but as I say, if you look at, if you strip out all the noise from the market activity and everything else, and you look at the, the core fundamentals, what is the economic scenario? It's that growth is low and going to stay low, and inflation is not really a problem. That's not an environment where bonds get destroyed. It may be that their valuations are relatively rich and we're experiencing yeah. a correction, but we're not talking about the start of a huge bear market. And for the 10-year Treasury yield, that means it going to what level, in your view? Um, I, I mean, I, I, I think we're still trapped in a range, to be okay. honest with you. I think we're between one, 125 and 175 in 10-year yields is where we stay.